Golden Spiral Media presents The Blacklist Exposed. Hello, special agents. You have come to the right place. Welcome to The Blacklist Exposed. I am Agent Troy Heinrichs. We are here with a special edition of The Blacklist Exposed with our Season 1 Special Archive Episodes. The following episode appeared on the TV Talk Network for Season 1 of The Blacklist, and we're bringing it to you here on The Blacklist Exposed, remastered and used with permission from TV Talk. We hope you sit back, relax, and enjoy this special episode from Season 1. You're tuned in to TV Talk, The Blacklist. Welcome to TV Talk, America's number one TV talk show network. And now it's time for TV Talk, The Blacklist. Well, the next time I ask for a pint of Reddington, I will now need to clarify beer, not blood. Welcome to TV Talk, The Blacklist. I'm Troy. And I'm Dave with you tonight for the first part of the fall finale where we meet number 16, Mr. Anslow Garrick, airing November 25th, 2013. I want to take a quick moment to thank Doug in Atlanta, Michelle in Ohio, Ed in Southern California for answering our last talkback question via the TV Talk app available at tvtalkapp.com for all of you iTunes and iHeartRadio listeners who may not yet have that app. But there was one talkback we got last time, Dave, that really struck a chord with me because, as you remember, our talkback question was, did Red kill Sam out of mercy or for his own interests? And Dawn actually had a talkback that... Give an interesting thought to who Sam just might be. Red definitely killed Sam out of mercy. He didn't want him to suffer the six weeks. I believe that Sam is Red's brother, and that's why he gave Lizzie to his brother to take care of him. Uh, he was definitely heartbroken when he suffocated Sam, and I'm convinced that they were brothers. An interesting concept, Dave. Could Sam and Red be brothers? Oh, absolutely. They certainly could be. I'm still holding to the fact that I think that's just too simple for this show. I think that's too expected. But it it very well could be. He was uh, Red was definitely moved by having to to kill Sam. So it's going to be curious to see where that goes. Now, after this episode, I did have to check out. And I know NBC puts out a nice little kind of post the blacklist, like after the blacklist kind of conversation for maybe some of these answers that we've been looking for. And in that episode, they did actually note that it was mercy, not interests. Although I think he probably got two birds with one stone in my playbook. Yeah, yeah, I agree. And he needs all of the plays he can get as we roll into this week's big bad, this guy, Anslo Garrick. Now, he's number 16, and this is the highest number we've seen so far this season on the blacklist. And I'm still really curious to find out who the next 15 are, because this guy looks just darn creepy. Yeah, this is a pretty hard-nosed guy here. And we we enter the show this time doing that kind of time jump thing they've liked to do these last couple episodes. And we show up with Rustler lying on a cot, and he's obviously been badly injured. And then suddenly we track back 13 hours to a bar in Munich. This flashback scene to this week, I don't know if it was needed or necessary for the show. It just didn't have enough information to make it worthwhile, I don't think. What do you say, Dave? Yeah, yeah, I agree. I I found it actually kind of a little disorienting this time. I don't know how the two tied together, I guess, is the issue, right? I didn't know how the... Yeah, the, the, the leg gets shot up, and he's just laying there on the table, and then he's back in Munich. So is something going to happen in Munich tied to the leg on the table, or is the thing in Munich actually tied to the overall story for tonight? So the beginning was a little bit all over the map for me and didn't actually set up anything related to Onslow unless it's something that we're going to see in part two next week. Exactly. I was just thinking the same thing. But we quickly move on from that, though. Uh, we're only that opening scene is just a few, actually, maybe 30 seconds, would you say? And then, like I said, we're at that bar where, and wrestler is showing up, obviously not shot. It's 13 hours earlier. Uh, there's They make mention of the fact that the chip has been used to track red down. 
he, he's needed back in Washington. Liz needs him. How did you like the ploy? Because here he's coming to Red, finding him because of the chip, but he specifically said, we tracked you down because she's been detained, obviously referring to Lizzie, which of course we later know was a lie. So do you think that they're trying to pull on Red's heartstrings a little bit when it comes to Lizzie? Oh, absolutely. I think, I mean, it's obvious the attraction or affection or whatever you want to call it is obvious to everybody involved in this. So, yeah, I think that's exactly what they're doing. Now, I know that I probably am going to have nightmares sleeping tonight with all the blood and gore that was on this episode this evening. Thanks for the warning before the episode that there might be some violent scenes. But I think I'm a little more creeped out by burning dolls in a bedroom. How, how about you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, and I was looking for a little bit more. I thought maybe we were going to get a little more insight there than we actually get. There was certainly some stuff teased or hinted at we've seen some pictures of her dad and lizzie as a little girl and then the uh burnt bunny that led to some fire flashbacks so i guess that's a question for the audience right so answer any kind of comments or feedbacks you want via the tv talk app how many of you were actually watching that scene like with bated breath like what is she going to pull out of the box next is there something in there that you saw that we didn't see because I, I was literally sitting on the edge of my chair going okay is there something on the envelope is there something in the box is there something on the back of the bunny right I, I was really looking for like a picture of her dad with red or, or you know or something anything like that you know a young red nothing that i seen unless one of our listeners seen something yeah so if you'd seen anything in the box that she was going through let us know via the tv talk app use the talk back button right there in the center of the app so of course they bring in red and we kind of go back to the original kind of plot line story dynamic where there's going to be some kind of event. In this case, Red himself is the actual event as he has this conversation with Harold and Wrestler about, you idiots, you fell right into his trap. Right, right, exactly. The FBI has found out that Red actually has a price on his head and someone's coming after him. And in reality, the FBI just followed the playbook and they did exactly what they wanted. Now they have Red in this confined space and they're going to take him down. Well, the interesting thing about this is the fact that if I'm red, I know I like to hear myself talk and I come up with some great whimsical lines every now and then, but dude, just shut up and run. <laughs> Get out of there. If you know they're coming for you, why are you still talking to Harold? <laughs> it happens pretty quick, though. They come in, and, uh, and again, I know in the past conversations we talked about this, but I, I don't think you can deny this fact. The Die Hard tie-in with this episode in particular was huge for me. Are you a fan of the Die Hard movies, Troy? Oh, absolutely. When I saw that uh, Lizzie was in the elevator, at first I thought, you know, okay, she's got to take off her jacket because she just doesn't have the vertical ups needed in order to get up to the ceiling. So she needed to loosen some weight from the blaze are there to try to get up a little bit higher but then i saw that her feet had no shoes so i thought for sure okay here's the you know mclean walking through the glass in order to exactly get moving on but apparently she uh, didn't have to step on anything sharp she cuts her hand <laughs> instead right and then also the scene where they uh, take out all the electrical things with the chainsaw through all the conduit that was that was straight out of die hard as well yeah i'm gonna for sure write that one down as either cutting the hard line or cut the cord it's my new you know, lines <laughs> from that scene with a chainsaw that was definitely something reminiscent there but the other thing that kind of threw me back here was i mean we know john eisendrath is behind the show and he worked on alias and this had a very similar feel to an alias episode where uh, Quentin Tarantino actually starred as a former agent breaking into a compound known as SD6 on Alias to try to steal something from the vault. So in this case, the vault is the box, and the thing that they're trying to steal is Red himself. So I'm wondering where this actually lines up with Anzo. Is he just an associate? Has he got ties into the FBI or the military or the U.S. in some way? Because it sounded like he was either British or somewhat English, not much of a foreign national with his face being kind of deformed like it is it was really kind of hard to say but he definitely had some type of an accent they kind of alluded to how that happened right it, to me it sounded like red actually did something either it was a, a backfire bullet or red shot Anzo himself I, I wasn't sure if you picked up on what actually happened there well, and they, they make an actual a couple different references to it because at one point Red says, uh, this guy doesn't go down easy. I should know. I put a bullet in his head once. Later down in the episode, they're kind of taunting each other, 
he makes comment about needing plastic surgery, you know, and saying something. If I'd have known, you know, you'd end up looking that way, I would have aimed higher or something. I don't remember the exact phrase, but the red, red and him have had issues before, and he's definitely hurt red, and red has hurt him. Yeah, and the great thing about this episode too was this kind of relationship. I mean, it did set it up a little bit with wrestler and Reddington in the beginning with the flashbacks, and now we know what the leg is all about. But I think this is great because we hear how Onslow and Red and wrestler are all kind of tied together from this 2008 botch job where he's actually tailing red. And it was basically wrestler that put red and Ansel together in the first place. Right. Exactly. That, that's one thing that definitely came out of this episode is we now know that whole backstory. Yeah. And it seems like wrestler was really tied to red in more ways than one. Cause we learn a little bit about the fact that because of the Reddington case, wrestler basically has to give up on love. I don't think he was married yet. He was engaged. Correct. Yeah. I believe it was a fiance. If I remember correctly. Yeah, it cost him his love affair. So, not a good thing. Yeah, definitely not a good thing. But then, you know, wrestler is almost having a little bit of a love affair with Red. You know, they're kind of sharing a moment. They're talking about, you know, how they can survive with each other. And wrestler isn't going to give up the code for the box. So wrestler and Red are in this box for the long haul, depending on how long we think wrestler might actually survive with this shot to the leg. Yeah, and it's getting pretty serious pretty quick. His carotid artery's been at least nicked. Red's getting concerned. Red knows himself some uh, medical stuff. I mean, he uh, he's had some medical training somewhere along the way. Yeah, at least field training or something. Maybe from back in his days in the Navy, you know, they had to go through some kind of field procedure because not only does he do the the field blood transfusion, which is where I, I, I definitely do not want a pint of blood, that's for sure. <laughs> but then he also go ahead and does this kind of surgery where he flash fires the carotid artery to kind of see it up and make sure that you won't have any more seepage from that femoral artery. Yeah, that, yeah, that was a pretty gruesome scene. I was really rather surprised how explicit that was. This is all going on inside the box. Then outside the box, we have this Onslow character. He's got a, a team of crack people who seem to breach the compound very quickly, but as soon as they get close enough to the box, Onslow decides to take them out by ricocheting bullets off the glass. <laughs> I don't know if that was planned or just an accident. He was trying to shoot through that glass to get to red, and obviously, you know, there's nothing getting through that, but it, it takes out one of his henchmen standing behind him, which it, it just happened real quick. It was almost just happenstance, but it was kind of a goofy scene. Well, I mean, it probably added something to the show, right? Because it's it was so gruesome tonight, right? Especially some things that come up later in the episode. So it was almost a little bit of a comedic relief, if you will. But it also showed the drive and determination that Ansel had to take out Red because he didn't even think twice about it. He just put the gun up there because he was so ticked off. He just wanted to pull that trigger at any cost. Right. And it also sets up for what's going to happen next because it's obvious bullets aren't going to work. So they're bringing out the C4 now. Right. And of course, they don't have enough. So they're going to have to try to find more. And of course, as they're going through, they come upon the armory. Now, pretty much anybody they've come up to through the course of the evening, they've taken out. So the real question is, why do they take Harold and the CIA agent lady captive instead of just taking them out right there on the spot? Right. Yeah, but they don't. They bring them in like POWs and they parade them right up there in front of the box. And what was really interesting was I thought for sure they might not kill Harold, right? Because Harold's at least higher up and they could get a bargaining chip for them. But I thought for sure if I'm Onslow, I would have turned to the CIA agent and shot her the minute Harold said, no, I'm not giving you the code. Yeah, I was kind of surprised with that, too. Actually, there wasn't even a reference made to that or not even an attempt made to go there. They re they really kind of leave her alone. Yeah, because he's really going after Red in this episode, and he's trying to basically pull people in from Red's life that are going to get Red to basically kill Wrestler or get the code out of Wrestler because Harold's not going to give up that code. So I'm surprised he didn't turn and say, well, let me go against Harold to say, Harold, who do you value and take somebody out on Harold's side? So right. Harold would give up the code then on that perspective. Exactly. But uh, they don't. Everyone kind of holds their ground. And in the meantime, while all this is going on, we still got Lizzie out there barefooted with uh, by now she's armed herself up by taking out some of the bad guys and she's out there doing her best John McClane. Yeah. And this was also a direct tie back into that alias episode because Cindy Bristow was basically on her own trying to sneak back into SD six to save the day. And just like Liz, as she's going around trying to take out these transmitters in order to get the telecoms back up and running, does she get captured in the end? Just like Cindy did back in that alias episode. Some point in here, the computer nerdy guy, 
gets involved and uh, Liz hooks up with him and that's how they figure this all out about the, the, the comms are being jammed by these jammers and they need to find them and destroy them so they can get an outside line or get a cell signal. Well, I think that's the greatest thing about this, right? Because the computer nerdy guy is still on the loose. So if you're a computer nerdy guy like I am, you know, we're actually going to save the day. So I think that's a really good call out <laughs> for us. So now back in the box, we've got we've got Rustler and uh, Red. They're, they're kind of getting, uh, they're sharing some quality time here. They're, you know, they're just trying to plot an escape. They're trying to figure out exactly what they're going to do. Yeah, and it was a really interesting conversation because when you think about it, you know, he's like, why are you saving me, Red? I chased you for so long, you know, five years trying to basically end your life and end your career. Why are you now trying to save me? And Red basically goes into this kind of monologue about how, you know, today you're my friend and tomorrow you're my enemy. So when is that time going to expire on this contract that Red and Wrestler have? As I think we move into part two next week, we're going to see, you know, does that contract come to an end quicker rather than later? Right. And we get Red going into this whole waxing romantic thing about wanting to lie on the beach with the sun on his face and drink a fine wine and be with a warm woman between cool sheets. And, you know, it just kind of goes on for a while. (laughs) I have to remember that one next time. Dry ice. Buy dry ice. (laughs) Would you call him a romanticist? Would you call him a poet? How would you a label little, Red? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit of both, a little bit of both. So I think that's what we're going to do for our talk back question this week because I found that scene was very emotional, very moving myself. So I think we'll throw the talk back question out there. So if you remember, Red was basically having the conversation about you know why he doesn't want to die or why he isn't going to let Ansela win, and it's because he wants, he wants, he wants. So the talk back question this week is: What is your one thing you want? The one thing that keeps you going every day. That's a great question. I can't wait to hear the answers. Well, what's your answer? I would have to say my family. It would have to be the family, the kids, the grandkids, my parents, my wife. It's the easy answer, Dave. Come on. It is, it is, but that's what it's about. That's why you get up and go to work in the morning. It's what you know, it's why you do what you do. What's your one gluttonous, you know, Havana Cuban smoking it on a mountain? <laughs> <laughs> Probably just my obscene love of horror films and the fact that I just got to go see everyone that comes out in the theater. I spend most of my weekends, my, me and my wife, sitting in a theater watching movies. Yeah, I mean, I, family would definitely be mine, of course. But at the same time, I think if I had one guilty pleasure, one thing that I could do again, I think I'd actually probably head back out to the Golden Gate Bridge. It was just something surreal about standing up there at sunrise on September 11th on the 10 year anniversary and just standing there and having that kind of breeze blow in your face and have that freedom. So I think that's kind of where I would land based on how Red was describing it. That's very nice. That's much better than watching a movie. Hey, movies are good too. You can't pass them up. So we think that wrestler is dying and Anzo actually kind of goads the conversation, right? Because he's talking about how sepsis is going to set in, and even that pint of blood that you know Red's giving you is going to turn basically poisonous. Red almost had a look on his face like that's actually going to happen. Like sepsis is not too far off, and so he's got to come up with a different game plan in order to make sure Wrestler lives long enough so that he can use Wrestler for whatever his long-term plan is. Right, yeah, and it's and it's obvious that Angelo is trying to get it red, and Red's trying to get it Angelo, and I think Angelo gets actually gets under Red's skin a little bit with those with those remarks, and actually, you know, kind of gets his goat, if you will, but he definitely gets his goat when the next thing happens, and that's when he brings one of his assistants up to the glass. Yeah, I mean, this was probably the most graphic scene I've seen on television in quite some time, and I'm really glad for the warning. I'm really glad that it was you know almost ten o'clock by the time I saw the scene. <laughs> you know, in central time zone, 11 o'clock Eastern, because man, when that bullet went through the head, I was not expecting that much red to be on the television screen. I thought I had to adjust my red green tint for a minute there on the, on the <laughs> there was so much red. <laughs> Yeah, it was a very graphic headshot, and I apologize, I can't remember the character's name, but it's the female assistant that's been with Red the whole time. Onslow uh, blows her head off, basically. Yeah, and I mean, it was interesting to see, you know, Red actually kind of plead with Harold, even though Red, I'm sure, knows because Harold and Red go back, you know, way back to their you know early careers before Red disappeared. So the fact that Harold isn't going to give up that code, obviously, he knows that this p- person isn't that special to him like Dembe is because when Dembe gets put down on his knees, they have some kind of, I guess, spiritual prayer that they kind of chat with each other through the glass. 
Yeah, I'm not, I'm not quite sure what that was, but it was almost like a chant or a, or a prayer would be a good way of putting it. It's obvious they have some type of a kinship that we don't understand to this point yet, but they have something more meaningful than just a assistant boss relationship. Right. I mean, they're definitely more tied together, and that's probably because this, for when Dembe gets put on his knees, it's the first time he actually goes to Wrestler to say, Wrestler, give me the code. And Wrestler doesn't even give up the code at that point. So he's basically begging Wrestler, begging Harold, and then he says the prayer with Dembe. And if you remember, Dembe has that scar on the back of his shoulder that was part of the slave trade ring right. um, from back in episode two. And so because of that, I think that's why there's more of a kindred spirit because Red actually saved him from that and almost adopted him as a son, if you will. Yeah, right. And we don't actually see him killed. It's it's certainly implied. We just the screen goes black and there's a gunshot. So that's certainly implied that the bay is now no longer with us. So interesting setup for next week. This is our first kind of part one, part two of the blacklist. And next week we're going to have the finale, which will also be the fall finale from what they are telling us. So we know that Liz is captured. So I'm going to have to assume that Liz is going to be on the chopping block and we're going to see Liz basically put head to head with Red and hopefully we'll get some answers. Yeah, it should be the ultimate showdown there because I think uh, Red will do just about anything to save Liz. But if we know anything about network television and we already know that the blacklist has been ordered up for an additional nine episodes in the spring. So if we're playing along at home, we will finish the fall with 10 and then we'll have 12 more in the spring. So even if we get some answers, I'm sure there will be a million more questions. <laughs> exactly. Any answer we get is going to be followed with two more questions. So again, we want to remind you to answer the talkback question via the TV Talk app. And again, our talkback question this week is, what is your one thing you want? That one thing that keeps you going. And be sure to tune in next week when we do find out all about those answers on the fall finale of The Blacklist, where hopefully all of the secrets will be revealed. Until next week, I'm Troy. And I'm Dave, dodging bullets and taking out wireless jammers as we cross off the criminals on The, the Blacklist. Blacklist. And now it's time for this week's Talkback Clips. We hope you enjoyed this special version of The Blacklist Exposed, previously aired on the TV Talk Network and used with permission. Until next time, I'm Agent Troy Heinrichs. That's at Troy Heinrichs on Twitter. And if you want to learn more about me, just visit, well, about.me slash Troy Heinrichs. And I'm Agent Aaron Peterson. You can hear me talking about movies and TV on the Hollywood Outsider podcast, as well as remake this movie right we are available at thehollywoodoutsider.com or on Twitter at H underscore Outsider. Be sure to subscribe, download the app, submit your feedback, but most importantly, keep yourself off of The Blacklist. The Blacklist Exposed is a Golden Spiral Media production. Find more of our great podcasts at goldenspiralmedia.com slash podcasts.